thank you for, for being part of our program. Now, the, these guys, I love what they were doing. I was saying, uh, Omer and John, keep doing, you know, keep uh, challenging the government and everyone else. As a matter of fact, tomorrow they have a, a 4 o'clock meeting at the White House with President Obama. So we are so thankful that they could be here with us, you know, tonight. So keep on keeping on, guys. Now, uh, Omar, you're from uh, Sudan. You're from Darfur. And we also have the Sudanese community uh, from Dayton, from the Sudan tonight. Why don't you stand and let us welcome you. Thank you. Now, Omar, you know, you, you coming from the area, t t really, how have we gotten to the place where we are today? I'm so glad to be here. Uh, Michael, we came to this point because we had a government sitting in Khartoum that chose to be at war with its own people. It happened in Southern Sudan before. It moved to the Nuba Mountains in the center of the country. In Southern Sudan alone, about two million people died in a protracted war that it started actually before Sudan gained independence in January of 1956. The war in the South started in August of 1955, but it continued all the way until they negotiated what is called the Comprehensive Peace Agreement with Dr. John Gorang, the leader of the Sudan People's Liberation Movement in January of 2007, uh, 2005, sorry. So that war continued in the South and then kept on moving north to the center of the country in the Nuba Mountains where a scorched earth policy by the government of the day killed over half a million people oh. and sent over a million people to the displaced camps now, how, all over the country. What time period for a half a million people that dead? This was done in about three to four years. This is a, a, a war that is continuing to morph itself into local conflicts, but it's always fooled by the government. And then the, la the last point where we are today is in Darfur, where over 450,000 people killed, over uh, 250,000 people crossed the uh, border to be in Chad as refugees, over 2.7 million people displaced within the border of the country, inside Darfur, scattered in over 154 campsites. Some of them as large as 100,000 people, like the Kalma camp in Niala, where you, you guys are working, and some of them are very small in different areas in the country. Some camps can be reached by international NGOs. Uh, these are the non-governmental organizations that they work in the relief effort and the humanitarian assistance. Some of them cannot be reached uh, because they are in a very difficult terrain or they are simply afraid of exposing themselves to the world, including those who assist them because the government of Sudan, when they hear about them somewhere, the, the first thing they do, they send the anti bombers and the helicopter gunships to kill them. Mm. Now, John, you helped co-write uh, Not On Our Watch with Don Cheadle. And what, what's the world doing about this right now? You think, as you, as you said in the introduction, it's the, it's the worst humanitarian crisis in the world. You think the, the world would... would uh, flex its muscles and try to get involved in some way, shape, or form to stop the genocide that's unfolding uh, that Omer is just describing. But what we've become focused on uh, as, as a government here in the United States and governments around the world in the United States is to treat the symptoms of the genocide and the war from which the genocide springs. So in other words, we send over the last few years billions of dollars in humanitarian assistance, important life-saving assistance. Yes. We send peacekeeping forces out there, but there is no peace to keep. We haven't committed 
to a peace process that can actually end the war. In other words, we've decided that it's okay, it's enough for us to manage the symptoms of this war and this genocide, but we haven't decided to end it. And I think that's the critical missing ingredient. And as a taxpayer, think about how incredible that concept is. Here we are in the midst of a financial crisis, and we keep sending hundreds of millions of dollars a year over to this place because we haven't made the political decision, let's just end it once and for all. So now we have a new team in Washington. They get a new shot, a new chance, you know, with the new president and the new secretary of state. And the president has just named a, uh, a special envoy, a peace envoy, who happens to be actually a general in the uh, Air Force. And it was a very good man. Uh, uh, in fact, grew up in Africa as a son of missionaries. And is a very studious guy and really wants to, to, to make a difference there. So he has to hear from people like us in churches all over the United States that peace, that ending the crisis, making peace needs to be the central priority. You know, we have the biggest military in the world. Everyone knows that. But few people understand that we also have the biggest diplomatic corps in the world and the most effective diplomatic corps with huge amounts of peacemaking experience. We just need to take a sliver of that peacemaking experience and dedicate it to ending, once and for all, the cycle of war, famine, and genocide that has beset uh, uh, Sudan now for so many years. And, you know, we were, we were talking in the back just a little bit ago that this is a becoming more and more a grassroots issue of the church, and it is totally bipartisan. And it's really important for our governments to understand, both in Canada and in the United States, that uh, if it matters to God, it matters to the church. And the church needs to be at the center of, uh, you know, stopping uh, this tragedy, genocide against uh, innocent, innocent people. Well, you know, we are here tonight for, the, for that very reason, to really...